like everyone to just grab their own ear and just pinch it until you feel some pain. Anyone? Anyone? Now, how many of you, show of hands, felt some pain or discomfort? Thanks very much. <laughs> just jokes. <laughs> uh, my name is Kieran. Um, I'm a chiropractor in Black Bend Chiropractic just down the road. And today's talk is about pain and just what pain is and how you fix it. Not necessarily what you do to fix it, okay? There's many different types of treatments, um, but today's about understanding just what pain is and how it is fixed, not necessarily what to do to fix it. Let's start off with a story about my dad. So we're from South Africa, and my dad played semi-professional rugby for pretty much his entire life. He played from the age of five, and then he, from the age of 12, he was playing provincial rugby. He's the ultimate man. He taught me everything I don't know. So um, one of the games he was playing, he ran, and he took a tackle and went down. So let's just pause there, and what happens in that instant is fast fibers shoot straight to the part of the brain called the thalamus, which is like the, like, the like Amazon center, and then from there it distributes to the rest of the brain. And shout to the brain and says, Wayne, you've just been touched on the, on the front of your leg. And a few milliseconds after that, pain fibers go to the spinal cord, from the spinal cord to the thalamus, to, to Amazon, and then from Amazon, it speaks and it says, Wayne, there's just been a sizable pressure to the front of your leg, and we should probably assess that. So then the, that part of the brain speaks to the rest of the brain, and it says, what's happened here? And the rest of the brain says, well, we're on a rugby field. We've taken a few tackles. We've been doing this for the last 20 years. This is completely normal. So the brain does nothing. And my dad steps up, and on his second step, his leg falls in half. He's broken his femur. Okay, true story. 30 years later, we're hunting, and um, the, the truth about hunting is that you have to keep quiet. Like, you know, like you stalk the animals. And uh, my brother, dad, and I, and my brother and I hear my dad screaming on the other side of the valley. So we run over to my dad, and I beat my brother, because I'm faster than him now. And uh, we get to my dad, he's clearly broken his leg. So my brother's an orthopedic surgeon, true story, and we splint my dad's leg, my brother takes the femoral pulses to check he's not dying, and uh, we rush my dad's hospital, the hunt's over, so we get straight into the MRI machine. So let's pause there again. Okay, so what happens is my dad's walking, he falls into a warthog hole, massive hole, hits the front of his leg, and in that moment, uh, pain fiber, uh, touch fibers shoot straight up to the base of the brain, Amazon. Amazon's like, Wayne, you've been hitting this, uh, you've, you've touched something on the front of your leg. And milliseconds after that, the pain fibers arrive, spinal cord, Amazon, Wayne, we've just had a sizable trauma to the front of our leg. Then the brain speaks to itself and it says, has this happened before? And it's like, yes, the last time this kind of pressure happened, our leg broke. So the brain says, let's cause as much pain as possible. Okay, so... That describes how pain works, is pain is protecting something. My dad comes out of the MRI machine and he's got nothing wrong with it. He simply had a dead leg. But the dead leg was enough for the brain to pick up as a trauma and it caused agony. So that is what often happens with pain. So we'll see that today. I'm going to try and summarize six years of medical school for you into four sentences, okay? Uh, so let's try that. So if we take away all emotion, thoughts, uh, fears, all cognitive thoughts, our brain is simply a ripe avo. So there's the brain in the head. <coughs> take it out. It's just a nice, soft, squishy avo. Okay. So the brain is encapsulated in your skull, and it is always adapting throughout your entire life. Your entire life, the brain's always learning something new, always whether you're five years old or whether you're eight years old. And the, within the brain, you have all these kinds of neurons and cells, and they just all speak to each other. Okay, so your brain picks up thoughts as a certain way that those pathways run through the brain. Okay. Off the age of five, they're pretty much there, but you can change how they speak to each other 
by changing some pretty cool groovy things in the brain. So like, that's what the brain cell looks like, and it's got all these little feet that spread over to the whole brain. And the last thing about medical school that you have to know is that the brain is always trying to pass off things as reflex. So eventually, once your body's learned the pain response, it doesn't have to worry about that anymore because the, the pain is there to protect you. And the brain doesn't think about it again until it becomes an issue with chronic pain, which is why I think most of us are here today. So pain principles, when you go through about eight, just facts about pain. <laughs> Number one is pain is always real, no matter what is causing it. So no matter what is causing it, the best definition of pain that I've heard is that pain is whatever the patient says it is. Okay, because it is all relative. Um, I excuse my ear, that could be excruciating for someone, it could be no pain for someone else. So a good friend of mine gave me permission to share this picture. Um, her name is Adrian. Can you guys see? She's an amputee. So her right leg's off, just below her knee. And she phoned me, she's like, Q, I'm getting pain in my right foot. <laughs> That's not there. Okay, so it's real, and she she uh, she said, Q, it's under the arch of my right foot, and she's got no foot. <laughs> so there's an example that she, she could literally feel real pain in something that was not even there. So we treated her other foot with a mirror. So we put the like, mirror there, and we treated the left foot, and her brain saw the right foot. And I only ever saw her once. And um, I thought she wasn't coming back because it's expensive or something. <laughs> but she said, Q, I'm, I'm fixed. I'm like, it's impossible. Like, you've had this pain for, for like a while. She said, no, I, I am fixed. So you get these miracle sessions every now and then. Not everyone responds that quickly. <laughs> but um, it's, it's just a cool case that you get pain in, some, uh, in something that, that isn't even there. The next example, this is from the British Journal of Medicine. Uh, yeah. Builder fell off a, a roof, lands with a, a nail straight through his foot. Bang. Gets rushed to hospital. There's the boot. He's in agonizing pain. They give him all sorts of medication, opioids. Nothing helps his pain. He's, he's screaming blue uh, South African murder. And they cut the boot off with surgical stuff. And the, and the, the nails miss everything. It's gone straight, straight through his toes. Okay, but he's at pain that pain medication isn't even blocking. So just an example of how pain can sometimes be in your head. In America, they get students to, to volunteer for uh, tests, probably for extra grades or favors or something. And they put this thing on and they say that there's a dial and they're going to turn the dial and it's going to cause headaches. And they had some people with uh, actual magnetic pressure and some people with nothing. And the results came out and everyone who saw the knob going up said, I have pain. Even though some people, the machine was just nothing. Okay, so cool experience. Uh, doesn't mean much, but it's pretty cool. Um, I drew this on my computer. And then we draw the next slide, which is the lines bowing over it. Can you see how like, the lines do look like they're bowing over? Then we take away the other lines and they're just straight. <laughs> okay, so it's a cool visual illusion, right? But, but you can trick the brain to, to learn certain things. And this one's pretty cool. Um, there's a checkerboard. Um, block A and block B are the exact same shape of, uh, shade of gray. And it doesn't look like it, but if you move them across, if we block out everything else, that is the same shade as that. But our brain has picked up the checkerboard and there's some groovy things in the head. And next thing we see those different colors as different, but they, they are the exact same. If you turn your head to the side and look at it, nothing changes. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I've got except pain. <laughs> Number two, pain needs an environment. Um, do you mind me mentioning your name? So I've just seen a new patient and she's come with, because I think I helped her a little bit maybe. Um, but we spoke about how pain has an environment. So sometimes the environment could be stress or your boss's name or your cell phone screen or the smell of your office 
or the angle of your chair, the angle of your neck looking at your screen. There's so many different triggers that can sometimes trigger chronic pain. So before you even experience anything, you can actually be in pain already because of that, how that brain circuit just learns a certain reaction to a small trigger. So in Australia, they did a, a study, they got some normal people to volunteer for a pain study. Um, they aren't normal because they volunteered for a pain study, but they had the, the hands um, like in a box and they had an ice cold rod, freezing cold. And they put the cold rod on the skin and at the same time they showed a red light or a blue light. And 100% of every person who had that test done, when they saw the red light, they experienced more pain. When they saw the blue light, they experienced less. So again, it doesn't mean much, but it's just a cool thing to see how there's often a, an association or an environment for pain. We already touched on the offices and the certain triggers. Um, but yeah, I find a lot of patients sometimes by 10 past 9 in the morning, the, the, the brain's like, listen, we've been here before. So before 5 p.m. at 10 past 9 in the morning, everything's tight. Because it just knows it's going to be doing this the whole day or this the whole day, whatever your trigger is. Pain is all about protection, number three. Um, from when you walk into our practice, we're judging you hard. You know? We're watching how you walk, how you limp, how you bend. Because um, that's an involuntary thing. The brain is getting signals, and the brain is avoiding certain movements. Um, you may recognize some of these when you've twisted an ankle. What happens? You start to limp. Um, we may start seeing in about five minutes' time some people sitting in the chair, you know. There's just an, an involuntary change of posture because there's a trigger for the pain. So that's just something to understand. Number four, pain and actual tissue damage are poorly linked. Probably the best example I can do for this is actually a visual one. Uh, example one. Who's scared of needles here? <laughs> if I stick this needle inside of me, is it going to be sore? Probably, no. I'll let you know, I'm letting you finish it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can find a trigger point in the muscle. And we can stick a needle straight into it. I felt nothing there. Should we just leave it there for the talk? Yeah. Or you can. It's fine, so that's it. Point is, some, some people have a phobia of needles, some people might grow up because of a visual trigger in the brain. Um, yeah, interesting thing. It's not sore. We can even do that to it. We can jab the skin a bit like that. That's, that's absolutely nothing. Please don't pass out. And, it's, and it's, it's gone. So that's just a cool experience. So tissue damage, you can see I was, I was damaging something, but there was no pain. In research, there's a, a journal called Spine that's like the chiropractor's dream. It's all the research about pain and just the spine. They did a study, saying Sean, I'm pleading. They did a study and they x rayed and MRI people with no pain. And they found alarming rates of wear and tear on the discs and spines and, and just everything. Alarming rates. But they have got no pain. So, we see patients, and um, mostly men are wimps, so guys will often scream for nothing. And often, often moms and ladies have got high pain thresholds, so they just don't complain. But the high pain threshold group is, is worse because there's just no alarm bells. So some people may come in for not much, but it helps because they then long term are going to be doing something for their health. But some people. Mind me mentioning, Susan's had pain for 15 years, dull aches. No one's taught her about her back yet. Or there hasn't been an alarm bell for her to see someone. Because it's been dull aches. Turns out she's got a high pain threshold. And she's got some boo things happening as well. So that's just something to be aware of. Number five, movement, not medicine, is medicine. Um, just a side note, my brother's a surgeon, as I said earlier, so nothing is against any healthcare professional. Everyone works together, we're all in bed together. Um, 
but from pain, chronic pain management, sometimes drugs isn't the only answer. And again, this is now research that came out last year, um, done by physiotherapist um, university, and they just said straight, uh, opioid analgesia have small effects on persistent pain, but that's the first line of treatment these days. So it just is what it is. It just is how the system is, but there is always something else to be done. Hopefully you can learn that today. Um, I'm quite passionate about movement. Um, I wrote a book about it, uh, but that's a different talk for a different day. Um, but the bottom line is that movement helps almost everything, right? Movement will help your chronic diseases. Can you stop moving? Well, just help your pain. It'll help learn new pathways in your brain. It will help your body forget the triggers for the other pain. Um, so yeah, movement is pretty good. So one of our goals as chiropractors, my colleague Ingrid's here, one of our goals of chiropractors is just to get people moving again, you know, because because the spin-off of that is huge. Number six, pain is a disease. Uh, so it's obviously a symptom, but sometimes it becomes a disease. So Stanford doctors did some brain scans in people with chronic pain, and they found that it's very similar to things like depression, chronic depression. Pain is very similar to things like fear. Pain is very uh, similar to cancer in, in just how the body responds. You know, So there's a thing called sickness behavior. When you uh, have man flu, which is serious, you know, you, you feel so down and you just feel lethargic and don't you shave your face and all these weird things happen, but it's the body, it's the brain saying, hey, relax, we, we are sick, we need to get better. And it's a problem when that happens when you're in pain and the answer for your pain is movement, but you just don't feel like movement. So that's, that's just an interesting one. Number seven, inflammation makes everything worse. Without inflammation, we would all be dead because that needle would have killed me because there's no um, inflammatory response. So infl uh, inflammation is what, what heals everything. But when it becomes too much and you're eating foods that are just overloading the inflammation, what happens is that the pain senses become very sensitive and you can have a trigger from almost nothing. Um, there's a few cool um, uh, like cases where people were just blowing on the skin, excruciating pain because the senses became so sensitive to the pain reaction. So a big part of what we do is just recommending good, clean eating. Um, it's a talk for a different day. Number eight, things get bet uh, things get, get worse before they get better. Um, not all uh, always the case, um, and hopefully never this bad. But but often when we treat patients, we explain that sometimes the day after, the same day, or the next week, something's going to be sore. It could be the same area that we're treating because we've inflamed it a bit. But it could be something else completely. It could be the neck because you're now sitting differently, you're moving differently. Something else often wakes up, and it's just the brain learning those new pathways. So things often get worse before they get better, and then some people just almost stop when it gets worse. You know. So my my little classic saying is, um, you have to get through some sewage before the clear water. You know, if you just sometimes fake it until you make it, and just just keep going until you get to the less pain response. So what can you do for your pain? Today we're going to teach you how to fix your pain, not what to do for it. But the answer for pain, according to the research, is the biopsychosocial model. Okay, this is my brother on the bed, uh, on the red, red shirt, and there's us hunting. My brother's the cleverest person that I know. He's an orthopedic surgeon. Um, surgeons and doctors fall under what they call the biomedical model. Okay, Without them, we would all be dead. Because you break your leg, you're dead if you don't get it fixed. Okay? If you have a bac bacterial infection and you don't get antibiotic, you're dead. Okay, So bio biomedical model works w well when there's one cause of something. You know, One broken leg, one bacteria, one virus. It's amazing. Okay. But what the research suggests is that sometimes for pain, you need to look at every factor, you know, because there may be something else, a little trigger, a fear, or something. So the answer for 
chronic pain management is is is, is like what they call a neural re-education. You you teach the brain what what normal is. And this is actually, if you think about it, what all physios, chiros, osteopaths, massage therapists, this is what it, what like everyone actually does, you know. You're working the body or exercise therapist, you you you're doing stuff to teach the brain something new, and eventually that becomes the new pathway and the pain goes away. So we're just trying to trick the brain, you know, like that uh, checkerboard. So neural re-education offers a hope, but there's a catch. Okay, the hope is that you can change. Like it's a fact. I I think I've spent my entire life doing this stuff. Um, I've, I've seen some pretty cool cases, and it really is true. You can change, but always a but. It takes time. Um, if there was a quick fix, I always say this. If, if if there was one session fix, I'd be the richest man alive. So I charge a lot of money for it. But there isn't a quick fix for anything. There's just long-term stuff, which, which we're going to touch on now. So to better understand how this happens, we can touch on a few brain concepts and how the brain changes. So the first of those is you have to be in, incremental. Everything you do has to be small steps, you know? One small step, one small move, one glass of water. It all, stops, it, it all starts with one, one of something. And then you build confidence in doing a bit more. The first guy who proved this was a guy called Eric Knudsen. And the, isn't that the cutest owl you ever see? They put prism glasses on this owl and they skewed its vision by seven degrees. And they queued a, a, a queue for food and it knew, like, it, it could see the food, but it was skewed. And it flew skew every time. But, like just like went off, off course because it, it obviously landed where it thought it was but there was no food and eventually it would find the food what they found was the more it practiced that eventually that that owl with the skew glasses flew straight to the food so even though it was looking there it was flying straight so the brain can map and change certain things just by how the different chemicals fly around the brain Again, pretty cool, won't change your pain, but it's pretty cool. Number two is agitation. And um, this kind of falls in with the um, things get worse before they get better. But whenever you're trying to practice something, who's trying to play a new instrument here before? Okay. <laughs> who's had pain before? <laughs> Never mind. Okay. When, you, when you try to do something for your body, your mind, you try to learn something, at first it's frustrating. So you just don't get it right and your finger spasm and you just get angry. That's the, the brain releasing a hormone called noradrenaline. Okay, it's um, epinephrine if it's in the brain, but it's adrenaline. And it comes from a part of the brain at the base there. It gets, gets released when you try something new and the circuitry goes all the way to the front, speaks to the brain, speaks all the way there. So that drug, the, the drug in the brain, the neuromodulator as it's called, attaches to the nervous signal and it almost earmarks it for some change. Okay? Hold, hold that thought because there's a tri factor that's actually needed for this. But when you try something new, a new movement, a new stretch, after a few days, it feels weird and stressful. But keep going because there's, there's some, some method to the madness. So you need, uh, what was the last one? Uh, ah, thank you. you need agitation. Then you need focus. So you, you just have to focus on something. And again, this is all, every slide here is a, a talk for a different day. But focus is a cool one because babies between naught and five learn from when they're born till the age of five, they learn, they can learn different languages in different accents. They learn how to walk, stand, jump, everything that, that, that we can do, a baby learns in five years because it's got no clouded focus. You know, its primary goal in life is learn. Whereas us, we have stress. We have bills to pay. We have we have spouses or partners. We have work. Just so much stress and stuff clouding our mind that we just often can't learn quick enough. So if you start focusing more on making a change, you can. And this all revolves around the second chemical called acetylcholine. That also comes from similar area, but just the base of the front of the brain. And it's, and, and it's pathway similar to the last one. Okay, but it, it also gets attached to the nerves. 
earmarked for change later. And the third um, chemical is dopamine. Who's heard the word dopamine? Cool. So yeah, so it's it's what happens in your brain when you get something that you don't expect. Okay? It's not just the happy hormone. It's not the likes on Facebook. It's the likes on Facebook where you expected one and you got two. That happens to me all the time. I, I only get two likes. But, but when you expect one and you get two, huge, crazy. When you expect five and you get four, depressed. Okay, so it works in both ways, but it works when there's a, a prediction error. Now, I think this is probably the, the most important thing to understand to, to today. If you have chronic knee pain, that first bend that you don't get knee pain will be like drugs in your brain. You'll be like, wow, that's pretty cool. And your body will crave that feeling. And we'll eventually try and get there, and it's going to go through worse inflammation after that. Knees always get worse before they, they, like, they like get better. But that feeling of pain-free movement or pain-free anything in itself becomes a drug. And that, that helps the, the circuitry change better. Some research about that. A key essential of changing your brain is sleep. So once all those chemicals have been released in that certain pattern of the new movement, you have to get get, get uh, sleep. So, again, this is a talk for a different day, but prioritizing putting things off at night and going to bed is so important. You know, just, just try to get more sleep than you're getting. That's a good start. Education. Um, this is probably my biggest passion is just educating people. Um, and, yeah, this is just four of the recent studies that, that, that show just education alone is treatment. So everyone attending here today, bank 70 quid. You've, you've, you've just treated yourself to learning about your body, and that alone is going to help you. So that's pretty cool. Um, number seven, make errors. Uh, if you've seen me, you've heard the word proprioception before. It's kind of balance exercises. So that's anything that you do to balance. And um, again, in the brain, there's a part called the cerebellum that that controls all of our balance you know so the more you are unstable the more the brain's only want to learn that because it knows that if you break your hip in the wild you're dead so anything unstable the brain's going to learn that pathway very quickly so we get patients doing some single leg stuff and it just speeds up the healing process normally Case in point. Uh, number eight, we almost finished. Number eight is love. Stupid one. But they did studies in the States. And uh, my old nephew always, always makes me cry. Um, weird. Brain's weird. So they did studies um, in the States. And uh, just viewing a picture of someone that you love um, decreased your pain. So that's, that's pretty cool. And it goes hand in hand with the next one, support. So the biopsychosocial model that we mentioned about five minutes ago, the, the way to look at a patient from every direction, one of the big mechanisms of that is support. You know, Having just people around you, whether it's a spouse, a partner, a friend, um, Sometimes, sometimes I become a patient's only support, which is really just sad, but, it, but it's a blessing for me sometimes. Because in that moment, my calling changes from, cool, let's treat pain to let's just be a good person, you know? So that's a big one. Um, and in closing, Mr. Ledger has to go. <laughs> but in closing, yeah, so there's just three, I, I, I think there's a few take-homes today, but there's, there, there are three big ones. Number one, we are adaptable and we can make a change. Um, so your brain, I, I, I think we know now how 